Hi everyone, this is Jason Burek of Wall Street for Me Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Me Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He runs the popular Money GPS YouTube channel, and he's also written a book by the same name. He has over 15 million views and, and almost 70,000 subscribers on his channel. David Quintieri, thank you for joining me again. Thank you very much for having me on. Now, David, uh, I want to ask you about uh, China, since you put out so many videos on so many different financial topics, but you put out a video in the last couple weeks about the People's Bank of China's balance sheet. It's 220 trillion RMB, which is just a mind-boggling number. What do you think China is going to do to solve this uh, problem that they have? They're going to do what all other central banks are doing, and that is simply to continue to print. And they believe that digging themselves deeper into a hole is somehow going to get them out of that hole. It's absolute insanity, but that's exactly what every central bank is doing. We are seeing the G3 central banks, let's say in particular with the US and the ECB claiming that they are going to be pulling back on liquidity. They're saying over $1 trillion worth is going to be pulled out in the next 12 months. If they do so, I think China may follow suit. But we are talking about a drop in the bucket compared to how much has actually been printed. So I don't think there's ever a way to get out of this mess. What's going to happen as a result, I think, will be the biggest financial calamity that we have ever seen in our lives. I think this will be much worse than 2008, to say the least. And people are not prepared. In fact, they are much less prepared than they were even then. I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. To add to your points there, uh, you know, these central banks really since the 2008 financial crisis, it was a private sector banking problem back then. What created the financial crisis in 2008? Now we have these central banks and these governments that uh, have papered over the problems and now they've taken on the liabilities of the private sector banks that were too big to fail. So, you know, China with this credit bubble, if you, if you convert that 220 trillion RMB in liabilities, what you said in your video to US dollars, that's almost $40 trillion. They don't have that kind of money. I know they have you know a very large trade surplus, but they don't have 40 trillion. So there's gonna have to be some type of combination of bailouts and currency devaluation, which um, you know is not free market, is not capitalism, is not Austrian School of Economics. So um, you know it's just central planning gone bad. And it's being done on purpose as far as I'm concerned because the way that we've always seen this happen is that they allow the bubble to continue to grow. They create these laws that are put into place that allow banks to get bigger and bigger and then a crisis happens. And what's the result? They always consolidate power and consolidate wealth. You have a guy like Warren the Insider Buffett who gets his wonderful deals, sweetheart deals that you and I could never get. They get those deals, they consolidate, There's everything becomes bigger since the financial crisis. The problems become worse, so how are they ever going to resolve it? They can't, and that's not without some sort of new monetary system or something to come in the future, but using normal means that they've done with you know reducing interest rates or money printing, we'd have to go to levels that you can only imagine. Yeah, and they've done a lot of backdoor bailouts and covert uh, quantitative easing. I've reported on this since 2014 that there's been trillions of dollars in currency swaps secretly injected with central banking agreements. I had a I had a source at a very high level IMF meeting here in Washington D.C. Bring me the information. Wasn't supposed to be in the meeting. Phrase currency swap was used hundreds of times by uh, all the major central banks and all the Treasury Department representatives that were there. So, um, you know, they're doing these things just to prevent the markets from collapsing. Now, the other guy that's corrupt, you know, you mentioned Warren Buffett, the other one that's trading on inside information that's committing felonies, basically treason, is George Soros. So these guys, George Soros is pro I would consider him basically a James Bond villain, a.k.a. Dr. Evil. That's for sure. I mean, there's a whole bunch of players in this game, but all we can say is that they are working together. The governments, the big corporations, and all these other individuals, they all work together against us. That's what it is. It's not a game of, you know, um, playing uh, different sides off against each other in, in this, uh, you know, is it uh, China versus the U.S. and everything. There are players bigger than all of this, and they really uh, move these um, chess pieces around, and we unfortunately get the short end of the stick every time.
that's an important point that you brought up there because I think there's a lot of people in the gold community, uh, gold bullion dealers, gold pumpers, alt media people who say that China is going to save everyone. And I don't think that's the case because if you look at the background, David, of a lot of these Chinese officials, either at the People's Bank of China or high up Chinese Communist Party officials, a lot of them, you know, went to the same Ivy League schools in the United States, the same type of uh, high level education schools in London area like Cambridge and those and Oxford. And so, you know, they're friends with all the main Wall Street players, all the main, you know, economic and political elites here in the U.S. and Europe. And um, a lot of the PBOC people are involved with the Bank of International Settlements. You know, they're working their way. Uh, there's higher ups in China, also at the IMF and World Bank as well. So it's not that they completely want to um, start their own system immediately. They're, they've intertwined themselves with this uh, current system as well to uh, mo uh, transition power over. I completely agree with that. I mean, you have to look at all of, the, of these governments that have been toppled in the past, and you would think for just a second that if China wasn't playing ball, that they would be toppled too, but you don't see that happening. We have to understand that to some degree, you know, of course, these governments have their own decisions and everything, but what really matters, those things go on behind the scenes, and they're all controlled by the same people. Exactly. Now, I, I want to ask you about this everything bubble. Uh, we have a lot of hedge fund managers. I think Jesse Felder was one of the first ones to coin this. They're saying everything's in a bubble now. Do you think all the asset classes are in a bubble now except for gold and silver? Yes. And it's obviously it's obviously being done on purpose. I mean, it's quite silly to not see it or ignore it. But you look at this, every asset class right now is doing well for the most part. But you have to really narrow it down because if I say stocks are rising, that's not a really good sense of reality because when I look at stocks globally, they're not doing so well if we extract the U.S. market out of it. Then you look at the U.S. market itself. It's actually only a handful of stocks that are pushing this market up. It's not the entire market. And why? Because central banks have been printing up money and buying shares. And they've been doing this, obviously, because they are transferring wealth from the average individual to the big corporations. That's the purpose of this. And they, of course, want corporations to own everything, whether that is uh, you know, public things or private things. They basically want the major corporations, conglomerates to own and control everything. You know, Look at the media controlled by six corporations, everything else. And there's no – yes, sir, you were saying – Oh, I was just going to add there that it's not capitalism and free markets that has created this this uh, world's largest wealth disparity in history. This is central banks and government intervention that has created this wealth disparity by you know driving up asset prices to ridiculous valuations. And you know these asset prices they're totally divorced from reality. The real glo the global economy is not doing well. There's a lot of evidence to prove this, and yet here we have asset prices continuing to move higher and higher. I mean the Dow went from 22,000 to 23,000 in record time, and it's almost at 24,000 already. It will probably go higher. There's no reason why it can't. I mean, if you're going to print up all this currency, there's no telling what will happen. But it's not a free market because you can see that if it was a free market, you would have different companies being picked and, and chosen that would go up. You would have different valuations, but you look at it. Some of these companies, you know, maybe the FANG stocks or others, you'll see the P.E. ratios are absurd. And that just continues to get worse as time goes on. The stock keeps rising, but their actual profits and everything aren't really doing well. And you'll see that there's potential turmoil, potential potential risk and fragility in these stocks. Doesn't matter. Their stock keep going up because they keep printing up money and buying up the shares. And then other people are riding the wave. And of course, their assets are rising as a result. But they wouldn't be even a fraction of where they were if it wasn't for the central bank interference within the markets. I don't expect that to change anytime soon, of course, until they are ready to dry up the liquidity. And I do believe that they will do so at some point intentionally. Yeah, and there's not free markets too because there's just not as much competition in a lot of industries as there used to be because in the United States, there's a lot of taxes and rules and regulation that's preventing a lot of entrepreneurship and new products and services from hitting the markets in a lot of different industries. But these, these central banks, David, they're basically hedge funds now. The Swiss Central Bank, you know, did their, their Euro peg. They created, they printed up all their uh, Swiss uh, francs 
to go and buy up assets to try to keep their currency peg. They became a hedge fund. They started buying enormous amounts of technology stocks. For a while, they owned over a billion dollars worth of gold mining stocks. The Japanese Central Bank is a hedge fund with its with its uh, huge share of Japanese stock ETFs, and that's created a huge stock market rally in Japan. So the, these central banks now are essentially uh, you know, very leveraged hedge funds. It is true, and you look at this in the actual financial media, you look at the governments, you look at people that are involved in finance in one way, shape, or form, and they are willingly denying that this is going on. They're saying, no, it's not the case. It's almost as if they're just completely oblivious to this apparent fact that central banks print that money out of thin air, they buy shares, and that's what's making the shares go up, and people don't it's not that they don't care. They, they are like avoiding this information. Like it's staring them right in the face. It's smacking them in the face and they won't look at it. And it's crazy. It's ridiculous. This should be the biggest sense of let's get the hell out of here. Instead, they're they're saying let's keep the party going. And that's just ludicrous because th this is what I always think about. The farther this goes on, the, the higher it goes, the, the longer it goes on for – is just going to be even worse on the way down. Look at any any of these crashes. The faster it went up, the even faster it comes down. That's that's unequivocal every single time. It always happens. And the central bank's reaction every single time you'll, you'll trace their, you know, their uh, interest rate policies, they are always too slow and they're always too late to the party. That's just the way it works every time. And they're doing the exact same thing right now. They're being so cautious, so, you know, trying not to just let's not cause any problems here and things will get crazy. I mean, the Dow could be at 30,000 in the next few months and they would still be at interest rates that are way too low historically. But it doesn't matter because as long as the um, everybody has that sort of idea that everything is fine, that's all they really care about. And that's an interesting point about the talking heads on financial television. So some of them may be dumb, just not have any common sense. Some of them don't have, you know, a financial markets background. They just they just repeat. They look pretty on TV. They read the news. They just repeat whatever, you know, is in their earpiece that their producer told them to say. But some of them, you know, are intentionally lying. And I think a lot of that, David, has to do with the sponsors. Who is paying their bills for these uh, main large business network television like Bloomberg, CNBC, up there in Canada, it's BNN. And a lot of the advertisers, David, are these large mutual fund companies and the large banks. And so, you know, they want to sell a lot of stock mutual funds, whether they're these new, you know, passive stock ETFs that invest in those FANG stocks, those couple of stocks, like you said, that are that are moving, pulling up the majority of the indices higher or selling, you know, bond funds. So um, that they're not disclosing properly that, uh, you know, a lot of their programming is heavily biased and it's influenced by their sponsors. You just think that if, if you're not familiar with how the system works, you're just see, oh, the sponsor advertised on TV, not that the sponsor is calling up and saying, you can't talk good about gold. You can't you can't uh, say anything good about cryptocurrency. You have to, you know, grasp at straws, like you said, find any fundamental justification you can find for why these stocks are going up and don't talk about that they're only really going up because of central banks just creating trillions of money and current uh, credit out of thin air. They're not willing to go and tell the truth. It's just not going to happen. You get nothing but talking points. You turn to any of these stations, you look at any of these websites, they're all saying the exact same thing. Why? Because they're all owned and controlled by the same people. So of course, you're going to get one viewpoint. The contrarian view is laughed at. You look at People that are out there, whether it's you know Mark Faber or anybody else that has a sort of a Jim Rogers who has a contrarian viewpoint to say, you know what, maybe these guys are in control or doing something terrible. Maybe they're not necessarily with our favors, you know, with our um, best interest in mind. And it's laughed. They literally laugh at the people, consider them to be ridiculous, and then after the market crashes, they sort of blame those individuals it's it's just really strange and we're right in the middle of it now we'll find out about it eventually when we look in the history books and we realize oh that's how they happened yeah well we should have been paying more closer attention it happens every single time and we're just right now we're seeing the same mistakes being made over and over again 
I'm actually friends with Mark Faber. I've interviewed him every couple months, many times over the years. I don't think he gets a fair shake at all on the mainstream business television. They call him a perma bear. But actually, since the 2008 financial crisis, I've been following his work extensively. You know, he's recommended a quarter of your capital in stocks, a quarter in bonds, quarter in real estate, and a quarter in cash and physical precious metals and maybe mining shares. And that portfolio, you know, has taken advantage of the asset price inflation, but he doesn't get any credit for that. They just talk about how uh, negative and bearish he is. So they're, he's not getting, you know, fair and balanced coverage from the mainstream financial media. And then, you know, anything he says that's, he's, he's, he's a very smart old guy, but anything he says that's, you know, not politically correct, they've just blown out of proportion recently. I don't think it's really fair, uh, fair what has happened to him lately. Uh, you know, the politically correct police has just gotten him. Well, he's not um, one of these individuals that they want to take seriously. Even though, if you, if anybody has read his book, Tomorrow's Goal, the excellent book, you can see the incredible knowledge this guy has. They really break it down in that book. But when I noticed the way that the interviewers bring him on and they are purposely asking questions in order to make him look really fit into that mold that they have for him. And that's really sad. He goes along with it, obviously, but he's up there. He tries to inject the, the truth that he has. But uh, I find that with certain people, they give him softballs. Other people like him, they, they purposely try to make him look like a joke, make him look silly. And that's how people see him. Literally, when he goes off the phone, they start laughing at him, and they, and they sort of bicker amongst themselves of uh, you know how uh, wrong he is or how silly he is or anything else. It's, it's quite sad, but that's the mainstream media. You're not going to get any truth from it. If anything, you're going to get pieces, and then we have to piece that together. That's the only way. Yeah, and you have over 15 million views on your YouTube channel, almost 70,000 subscribers, and I don't. You cover a lot of different markets. You're a smart guy. I don't think you would get a fair shake on the mainstream financial media, and you know they'd rather have a uh, a confirmation bias talking head on who will just you know say that oh stocks are in an uptrend, got to stick with stocks, or bonds are going to stay in a bull market for a long time. Uh, rather than give you a fair shot to go on there with, because y y you've proven that you can speak on a platform and you know what you're talking about, but you know they they wouldn't give you fair coverage the same as they would someone else. Of course, but if I had the exact opposite viewpoint that everything was just fine and rainbows and flowers, then it would be a totally different story. I'm sure my channel would be a lot bigger and uh, there'd be some probably some offers to come on uh, some of these shows, but that's not the truth and that's just silly to – to try and do that, but that's what a lot of people do. I mean, in a bull market, everybody's smart and everyone's driving a Ferrari. And then in the bear market, everyone has to sell it and take the bus. That's just the way it goes. Uh, speaking of bull markets, I want to transition now. I know you live in Toronto. I want to ask you about the Toronto housing bubble. I visited Toronto twice in the last couple of years, and you know, I'm just amazed at the amount of construction cranes. It's very similar to the Washington, D.C. area I live in. Uh, what's what's your experience? Give, give our listeners your boots on the ground perspective about how crazy housing prices and valuations for real estate are getting in Toronto. When I looked at the statistics, it showed that actually Toronto was the biggest bubble for 2017. That's how dramatic it has gone. You look at the year over year increases, it is just astronomical. Anything you see, any asking price, that means absolutely nothing. Asking price for a home is nowhere near close to the actual price that it sells for. So you have a lot of homes that are sell for, let's say, a million dollars. That million dollars is just, you're buying a home that's maybe uh, 100 years old in a nice area, of course, um, but we're talking about tiny little homes with very little land. If anything, you'll see two bedroom condos going for $700,000 uh, in good areas. You look at the suburbs where you get a detached home for a million dollars even. It just keeps spreading and spreading throughout the uh, greater Toronto area. Nobody, unfortunately, can afford this. But, uh, of course, this is the only way that it's been marketed to people is that you have to own your home no matter how big the mortgage. And the mortgage companies will give you as much money as you want. It doesn't matter what you earn. They're willing to give you literally as much as you want, as much as um, giving you – they'll actually do 1.5% in certain instances, 1.5% down. That's all you need. That's when you know things are ludicrous. You see the – um, even 5% in, in some cases, depending on which lender you're going to. It doesn't surprise me then to see the euphoria and the not just from the prices, but just the average individual. You look at the media and everybody else is saying 
Don't worry, there'll never be a crash. You might just get a little soft spot, a little you know, side side lining for a little while, but things will pick up and then it will increase dramatically after that. Everybody's just pouring their money in. And then what do they do? How do they avoid the bankruptcies? Those have declined. You're seeing that people are going to the stores. They're buying iPhones. They're buying new vehicles. They're buying everything. How? How is this possible? How are they getting all this money? Well, wages have declined uh, in real terms in Canada. So how is this possible? Well, what people are doing is they're basically taking their home equity line of credit, pulling the money out, and then they buy whatever they want with it. They also uh, have second mortgages. Both of these are on the rise to new levels never seen before. This is something that has been pervasive throughout Canada, but in particular, you're seeing that in Toronto and Vancouver, where prices keep going up. As a result, money keeps being uh, continuously uh, pulled out. Now, that's fine. As long as prices continue to rise forever, you won't have a problem. However, when the prices start to uh, decline or we have interest rates that start to rise, Once that person has to refinance after that three or five year period comes up, all of a sudden you're going to have a very big catastrophe. And that's what we're facing because the central bank is saying, look, we're going to increase interest rates. They're giving you a fair warning. But in fact, unfortunately, the um, home equity line of credits and second mortgages just continue to increase. I was in Toronto last year for a business trip. I went to visit the Sprott headquarters in downtown Toronto, right near the Toronto Stock Exchange. And on the BNN Business News Network television, that's like the main, I guess, business channel for listeners who aren't familiar up in Canada. And every five minutes, David, there was literally a commercial for home equity loans, second mortgages. My head, I was just shocked at how like obvious and blatant it was. It was reminding me a lot uh, now going back and reading about what had happened in the, in the United States a couple of years prior to the 2008 financial crisis, you know, with these teaser raids, the alt days, the option arms, you know, the ninja loans, it reminded me, is that what it's reminding you of too? 100%. You see what was just released recently and then covered up, Home Capital. They were doing the exact same thing, fraudulent paperwork and everything else. And then you had this little cover up that occurred and all of a sudden it's just swept under the rug. Nobody covers it anymore. That's the way this works. You just need to hide the real information that's coming out. It's a fact. They'll give you any amount of money. It really doesn't matter. These, Banks, these um, you know different uh, establishments that are out there, alternative loan uh, loans are are generally growing because people are unable to afford these properties, so they are basically going to the alternatives. As a result, you'll see a crisis forming. And credit card debt, to add to your point there, I think in the last 10 years, really since the 2008 financial crisis, so a little less than 10, but the uh, credit card debt for Canadians has just exploded. I think it's actually the fastest growth rate of credit card debt in any developed country. They're just taking on more debt. That's the way it works because there's no consequences as far as they're concerned. Look, their homes keep increasing and they're feeling good about it. So they're buying whatever they want. They buy their new cars. They buy anything. Look at Toronto. I mean... I'd like to really get the statistics on this. I haven't been able to find it, but luxury vehicles in this city are just, they're the most common vehicle, it seems. You can go down the street and see nothing but luxury vehicles as you're driving by. You see one, um, you know, maybe worker's van or something every so often, but you'll see every type of luxury vehicle, it's, it's pervasive. Now, what's why? What's happening? Are the wages increasing? No, incomes are declining in real terms and at the same time we have more money being spent so how does that make any sense how is the economy quote-unquote improving when actual incomes are declining it's debt do you, do you think it's subprime auto loan debt or do you think it's not quite there yet because i know in the in the u.s there's a really emerging problem of subprime auto loan debt that had really since the 2008 financial crisis the car companies just didn't have sales and um, I think in 2009, the car companies, the large ones here in the U.S., only had about $2.5 billion a year in subprime auto loans uh, debt uh, in sales uh, using like really bad financing. And then it's exploded. It's up tenfold in sales per year to $25 billion a year now in less than a decade. And I had on banking analyst Christopher Whalen earlier in the year, and he said there's a trillion dollars in derivatives now that Wall Street with the, uh, you know, the car companies have given these loans to Wall Street and they've chopped these things up and sell them off to pension funds for investment. So that's another bubble. I uh, haven't seen the statistics specifically for Canada. I have seen those ones uh, for the U.S. and it is increasing. It will increase. Canada, it, I don't know about the... Uh, but I'm-
in, in Canada, you will get cars for even sometimes 0% financing or 0.9% or financing. It's extremely cheap to get your hands on some sort of uh, vehicle or, you know, when you look at uh, real estate, it's extremely cheap. So people are taking it on and that's fine. But what happens when interest rates increase? That's the problem. People don't realize this. You know, you're leasing a vehicle or maybe you're financing a vehicle. You think that everything is fine and hopefully you're able to get this um, with a fixed rate. But a lot of people have been buying with um, houses, let's say, with adjustable rate mortgages or variable rate mortgages that are increasing and they're already feeling the burden. And that's something that I covered uh, just recently on my channel where interest rates have increased just slightly and there's already polls covering this that people have already felt that as a burden and it's starting to get to the point where they are unable to afford their daily expenses. And they're in the maximum amount of debt as it is. So it's not as if they can go further into debt. And do you think then that eventually in the near future, I'm not saying an immediate time frame, but maybe in a year or two, that this is going to trickle to the banks where they're the, the Canadian uh, the Canadian banks, for those of, of our listeners who are not familiar, the Canadian banks actually supposedly were in the best shape during the 2008 financial crisis. But do you think now the Canadian banks are in trouble and there's going to be a huge explosion in their loan defaults? Absolutely. Partially happening with the uh, real estate market, but also because the amount of derivatives that have been created ever since have really exploded. We've seen these go beyond where they're ever should have been allowed because you're talking about banks, not investment companies, not these companies that like to gamble on derivatives and everything else. We're talking about the major banking institutions, TD Bank and BMO and um, every, right. all of them, Royal Bank and everybody else. They all have trillions and trillions and trillions derivatives on their books. And guess what? If they start tumbling down, our deposits are at risk. And you think that they're going to be bailed out by, you know, the insurance and everything else, the CDIC, which is the equivalent of the FDIC in the States. There's no possible way that they can ever do that. There's not enough money to support that. So the central bank will have to step in. If the central bank steps in, that they would have to, of course, um, hyperinflate the currency. I think that that will go over well. Maybe they can do some sort of bail in and just take your money from another way and, and everybody somehow would be uh, totally fine with that, I'm sure. <laughs> it's um, being um, a slave is – being a slave is cool, basically. It's um, trendy. So that's, that's the way I see it anyway. Uh, or they could just call up Janet Yellen or whoever is the head of the Federal Reserve at that time. They can ask for a currency swap and then just not tell you Canadians that they are doing that, that they uh, took on, you know, uh, basically an interest free loan. There's so much, you know, backdoor bailouts that are going on now, David, between the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank, the Federal Reserve and the uh, Bank of Japan, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England. There's these trillion dollar loans that are basically interest free. The Federal Reserve gave out uh, we found this out from a one-time partial audit that Ron Paul got, you know, over $19 trillion in interest-free loans to large corporations, foreign governments, foreign central banks. At the So J Janet Yellen does, uh, the Bank of Canada, Canada Central Bank doesn't even have to necessarily do hyperinflation uh, directly or these bail-ins anymore. They could just do currency swap deals with the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve has been doing those. Uh, it's really, they had done small amounts of them in past financial crises for only billions and it had gotten larger and larger and larger. And then during the 2008 financial crisis, these currency swaps just exploded into the tens of trillions. So uh, we found this out from the Ron Paul one-time partial audit of the Federal Reserve that $19 trillion in essentially interest-free loans was given out by the Federal Reserve, uh, subsidized by the U.S. taxpayer and U.S. saver to foreign governments, uh, foreign corporations, and foreign central banks. So, um, you know, I don't think there's anything at this point, David, because there's no transparency from the uh, Canada Central Bank calling up Janet Yellen or whoever's in charge of the Federal Reserve at that time and saying, you know, we're not going to print a lot of uh, we're not going to print a lot of uh, Canadian dollars. We just need, you know, a currency swap line. Give us a currency swap line for this crisis. And the Federal Reserve will say, sure, we'll give you some dollars and you won't even have to pay any interest for 10 years or we'll just waive the interest payment at all. I, I think that's the way the system has gone because the U.S. Uh, just cares about, you know, maintaining the status quo. It's really sad. I agree. But uh, now uh, last question about the Toronto housing bubble. Uh, and there's been a, a documentary about this with a uh, empty – house tax in Vancouver where Chinese investors have come in, sight unseen sometimes, they don't even see the house, and pay all cash, pay whatever the price, 
they don't even visit the house. They don't even go go live in the house. Uh, are you seeing that as well in Toronto uh, around you where there's a lot of Chinese money maybe that's uh, leaked out through China through that credit bubble and either rich Chinese businessmen have stolen the money or people in the government have taken the money out and are buying Toronto real estate? Well, statistically, it's somewhere around 12% the last time I saw some statistics. The money coming from China, you know, all the new purchases that are happening – which is different than, for example, Vancouver, which was something like 30%. So that's what I had seen. But when you talk to people, when you see the, you know, with your own very eyes, you get a different picture. So I do believe that it is uh, quite a factor, let's say. I don't think it's necessarily all being purchased by Chinese investors. And um, that would be not very accurate. I, I think that people are simply locally here are really pouring every penny they have and they don't have into this uh, real estate market. And that's, in some ways, a lot worse. That's interesting. Yeah, I think there's just so many bubbles. You know, there's huge uh, housing bubbles now in Australia. A lot of it's due to Chinese money. So uh, I, I actually just saw on Twitter, some one, uh, one woman I follow on Twitter who has a large YouTube channel in Australia, she posted something about how a lot of people's uh, parents are paying for the kids' houses and mortgages and stuff uh, so they can start a family and, you know, do normal uh, normal adult type of things. And so, you know, I guess this is common now where because the housing prices have gone up so much due to Chinese money and other money that people in those countries, whether it's Canada or Australia, can't afford normal housing prices because they've skyrocketed. That's what um, when you look at it, Toronto is an example. People are just moving further and further away, but those homes are becoming more and more expensive. So you can't really escape that way now. It would be okay if the rents were at a reasonable price, but they're extremely expensive and they keep on rising. So people are really, really being trapped right now, and it's a big, big problem. And this goes for uh, other parts of the world, of course, too. Look at areas in Europe where you're seeing you're able to finance Amsterdam for one, uh, for one, just where you're able to finance the property at 106% of the property's value. So why would anybody go and rent? They'll just take on the maximum Wait. amount of debt. Wait, so you're saying you don't even have to put a down payment now because you can borrow 106%, so they'll put the down payment on for you and include it in the money you have to pay back? That's correct. So you wow. can basically get all the closing costs as well, uh, all included. You wouldn't, you know, maybe any renovations you needed to do or anything else. 106% of the property's value. I wonder if there's any uh, disincentive then from just walking away if uh, you're underwater in your mortgage then, because uh, uh, that's you know basically what ended up happening in the U.S. right because there was strategic a uh, huge explosion then in strategic defaults because people uh, had uh, their home value was not worth what their mortgage was. I don't know all the legalities of it, but uh, we'll have to see because of course it's all going to come down. So we'll find out about it as uh, time goes on. Now, I want to transition to Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. You've been covering that a lot lately. Uh, are there any altcoins you like and speculate on? Are you day trading these things? I don't day trade. I own a little bit um, of, of these different digital currencies, mostly from donations that I've get from my subscribers. But um, I think that Bitcoin ultimately is probably the best bet for anybody just because of the fact that it has so much infrastructure behind it. Maybe not the future if you, if you want to look at you know everything that's happening they're saying it's not good enough for the future it's, it doesn't uh, process as many transactions and there's so many better ones whether it's ethereum or others but i just think that there's so many different like whether it's bitpay or whether it's you know these debit cards and everything else that's being created it's being focused around bitcoin because it obviously has the longest history behind it and everything else so at this time i think it is beneficial now You'll see that it doesn't maybe go as high as other currencies have in short periods of time, whether it's Ethereum, for example, which really, really increased in a short period of time. But it also doesn't go down as exaggerated uh, as well. So I think that's important to know. It's more stable. I would liken it to basically the gold of the uh, cryptocurrency markets. Now, in terms of altcoins, one of them that I think is important uh, to look at, or two of them, I should say, is Monero and Dash. And in fact, any of them that allow anonymity or more anonymous transactions, I think that that is very beneficial because that's going to be more of a problem as time goes on. We can see that the governments around the world are trying to crack down. They're trying to do what they can to prevent 
people from getting into these, trying to make it more difficult. And as a result, we need to find ways around it. And those currencies there are going to be very important. That's that's one thing I think. Um, there's a lot of talk about EOS or EOS, which is uh, something that I don't know enough about, but I do have a very, very small uh, piece of that. And it's not even developed yet. That's That's one thing that we need to pay attention to as well. A lot of these are tokens. A lot of these are ideas at this time, and they're able to be traded on the markets, but the product doesn't even exist yet. One of the big ones, I think, is Steemit, and not, it doesn't get enough attention. It doesn't get enough credit, but it's the one that's functioning today, and it has such a powerful usage to it that you can actually have a decentralized platform that is something very beneficial to everybody in, in line, and I think that's not really getting enough credit. If you look at the uh, cryptocurrency itself, it is really at a low level where it should be much, much higher. And I don't even like to look at the cryptocurrency itself. I just look at the platform and I think it's amazing because with everything that's been going on with, you know, you know who is listening right now, it's not good news for you and I and for everyone else, in fact, because you don't want to have censorship and everything else. Then this offers us an opportunity to have a place to go and have a place to go to listen and to speak and not need to worry about all that. And that's something that I think is very important. Yeah, uh, my, my YouTube channel has been sabotaged, so I'm still getting a decent amount of views, but basically all my videos are demonetized uh, by default and I have to manually protest them. My ad revenue is down a lot. My channel, like your channel growth is enormous compared to mine, but uh, my channel basically stopped growing uh, over a year ago. So it's it's been a real uphill battle. So uh, eventually I might have to move more of my content either behind a paywall or to somewhere else. But uh, do, do you think a lot of this cryptocurrency, a lot, the total market cap is now over $160 billion, uh, at least it was before Bitcoin had this correction. Uh, a lot of people are buying these dips in Bitcoin. That's the type of bull market that we're in. The sentiment is, okay, it's going to keep going up. Eventually, I'm going to buy the dips here. Uh, do you think this has taken away a lot of capital that could potentially have gone into gold, silver, and mining shares? I do believe so. In fact, I, I think that a lot of people who have been waiting and waiting and waiting for gold and silver to rise have found this as an opportunity to go into cryptocurrencies. And then you have sort of a division there because a lot of people who are in the uh, gold and silver community, they think that uh, cryptocurrencies are bad. So I think that you know there's a lot of education that needs to happen here because it's not good or bad. That's not the way that we necessarily need to look at it. But I do think anyway, money has, has sort of left gold and silver and, and uh, found its way into cryptos and people have seen the gains as a result. I just don't think that the price that we're seeing of gold and silver are in any way, shape or form a relation to the actual physical metal. The physical metal is more in demand today than it was 10 years ago, but yet you look at the price and you just see the stagnation for years. It's been stagnating. So what's happening? Well, of course, we're talking about paper currency, the paper markets, whether it's the futures or anything else. You see these, what is the value? Like who decides what that value should be? Well, it's not investors anymore. It's just computers deciding what the value is today. As far as I'm concerned, I don't really worry about the price at all. I just keep and hold and the future generations basically will be able to have that you pass wealth down generation to generation a lot of cultures do this particularly in the east you see that it doesn't really happen in the west but uh, unfortunately for those people you won't be able to have a good chunk to be passed down and silver also to add to your points there silver also is the only commodity out of all the commodities metals and agriculture that's nowhere near its 1980 inflation adjusted high at least gold is over a thousand dollars but silver's you know stuck in the mud and so uh, i think we've gotten to a point now with with the paper prices of gold and silver where as long as there's a demand for physical metal especially silver where the companies that produce uh the gold and the silver they can't keep producing the same amount of metal at these prices. So something's going to have to give in the near future. I talk about this a lot on my channel that we're going to have to see as the minimum going forward, a new price floor in the next couple of years, 2530 silver. Obviously, I think it's going to go higher in the future, but you know, 2530 silver, 1400, 1500 gold, those are going to be the new normals at the minimum in the next couple of years. But I think, you know, it's human nature, David, and I'm not sure what your listeners uh, post under your videos because uh, I don't read all the comments. So you could probably comment on this but um you know it's human nature when something is going up like cryptos have 
is to sell a lot of your gold, silver, and other stuff and say, you know, this stuff's manipulated, it's never going to go up. And I think that's a very dangerous precedent, what you can do, because um, you're not diversified then. So if you own a couple different or a handful of different cryptocurrencies or initial coin offerings, you've put way too much of your capital into cryptos. So, you know, rather than taking profits off the top, I think what a lot of people are doing is, I've heard this from my listeners, I don't know about you, is that they've liquidated a lot of their physical gold, silver, and then also their mining shares uh, really since the beginning of the year. I haven't read uh, those comments, um, but I do see that there is a lot of negativity to currencies. And of course, I've attracted a lot of people who are in the gold and silver communities, and they are against cryptocurrencies. I don't think that they should be in battle together. I think that they have two very different purposes for me gold and silver is a buy and hold strategy but not to buy and hold to maybe even sell it later it's to pass on wealth that's the reason why you have it gold and silver has been money for thousands of years we've heard it all before but we don't know what will happen with anything else we don't know what's going to happen with cryptocurrencies so you don't want to put all your money into that but if you want to have some for transacting if i want to give you money do i want to give you gold no i want to hang on to the gold I don't want to give that up. I want to be able to use a different means of transaction and I could do using some sort of cryptocurrency that has anonymity so that nobody else knows. It's just you and I. I think that's important as well. Something that that's really the battle that I see within the comments uh, on my YouTube channel where it's not really doesn't really make sense to me to put these two into a battle. I think it's two totally separate things. Last question before I let you go. A question about NAFTA and President Trump. Do you think if President Trump either renegotiates NAFTA or, or gets rid of it, do you think that's really going to hurt the Canadian economy? To some degree, it will. I think that in the end, everything is being done for a reason with those in power to decide where the future lies, basically. So no matter what we see out there, in the end, everything's going to be worse for the average citizen. And that goes for anywhere. You see all these different laws that are put into place. I mean, they were talking about Brexit and it was supposedly going to happen. And all of a sudden, they're met with a brick wall. So I don't really have any faith in any of these governments at all. I think it's a total farce and it's a, really a joke to see it. And you, you know, you're, everybody makes all these promises and they never keep them. They're never kept. It just really sad to see it over and over and over again we're being swindled but um specifically with nafta i mean it was the most criminal thing to be set up so i i don't even care how it turns out i just would hope that nafta is completely just wiped out and we can do trade that's the thing it's, it's when they talked about the whole brexit thing they said you're leaving europe as if you know the uk is just going to fly out into the pacific ocean or something it's not the way it works you just you're breaking down this agreement and you're going to set up individual agreements that are more fair for that particular country that's the way it works it's great it's a good thing if we break down these agreements that have many many countries all agreeing and basically saying uh, you know one group of people deciding okay this country you're going to do this and you're going to have to abide by these numbers and these rules that doesn't make any sense why wouldn't you want your own country to be deciding the fate of it that's the way i see it so hopefully nafta will be wiped out will be eradicated and then canada could make an agreement with the us and canada could make an agreement with mexico and i think in the end it'll be better for everyone yeah, I'm 100 percent agreement with your comments about politicians and bureaucrats not helping out the common guy on Main Street, the middle class person or someone who's trying to get into the middle class, you know, save. They're being killed with rules, regulations, inflation and taxes. And it's it's destroying the middle class. It's creating lots of stagflation. It's misallocating capital to use an Austrian economics term. And then, you know, the, your point there with Brexit, I mean. There's bureaucrats there and politicians who their voters mandated that they do this, They that they leave, you know, whatever whatever rules and agreements that they had agreed to with the uh, the non-electable rich bureaucrats in Brussels uh, at the European Union. And, you know, they're not following their orders. So they're dragging their feet. They're hoping maybe that they can get a new vote on this. And they're trying to stop Brexit. And they were mandated by the voters to do it. And they're not listening anyway. So this is like the new normal. It's just it's just incredibly frustrating that the people in power uh, in all our elected systems in the developed world, whether it's Europe, England, the United States, Canada, they're, you know, they have their own globalist agenda. They're not listening to their own people. 
and it will just continue to get worse as time goes on. Well, I, I think what we just got to do, David, is we just got to keep voting the bums out. So <laughs> these these career politicians, you know, a lot of these guys, uh, Justin uh, Trudeau, uh, he had never even had a wasn't he a, a, a little uh, elementary school teacher or a lifeguard or something? He and yet now he's running your country. So he he he's from you know this uh, kind of family like the Clintons and the Bushes that is kind of like uh, you know obviously they're not royalty but they're similar to that. Uh, where in the past, you know, they've controlled your country, but he's clearly unqualified to govern uh, and he has no private sector experience. And here he is, you know, issuing new taxes and rules and regulations for people in Canada that can create jobs and grow wealth for your country. Yeah, well, I mean, they decide who's to be put in power. We don't have a choice, but we can at least with our ideas and vote with our dollars. And that's the way I think that it goes. We simply vote with our dollars. A lot of people talk about genetically modified food. They hate it. The, you know, they make a big stink about it. But then they go and they buy processed food, which contains genetically modified food. You just voted for genetically modified food. You say you hate the banks, but then you put your money in a big banking institution. Vote with your dollars if you want to do the most damage. That's the way it works. I completely agree. Or you vote with your feet. So, you know, if you don't like living in Canada anymore, you can go to another country. Now, it might not be easy to do that because, um, you know, the globalists and the people running each country are making it more and more difficult, especially if you're a U.S. citizen, because if you live outside the U.S. and you haven't given up your citizenship, you're still taxed like crazy. But, um, you know, it's still possible. But, yeah, this is the status quo really sucks. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of people aren't woken up like you and me. So uh, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But, Agreed. But uh, I enjoyed our conversation, David. And if our listeners want to find uh, more of your work, how do they do so? The best place to get me is on my YouTube channel, The Money GPS. I post videos basically every single day, sometimes even more. So you definitely want to check me out on there. The channel, as you said, is about 70,000 subscribers. It continues to grow. I hope to see you all there. The Money GPS. Thank you for your time, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the Canadian economy and if uh, there is a commodities rally, because, you know, we've had this kind of surprise rally in copper recently, but gold and silver haven't fought suit yet. We'll see what happens, and I uh, just want to say thank you for having me on. Wall Street for Main Street needs your help. Since the middle of 2016, YouTube continues to increasingly censor and sabotage the growth and success of my channel with dramatically slower or no subscriber growth, a huge decrease in views per month compared to 2016, and well over $10,000 lost in Google AdSense revenues the last 18 months. I should have been way over 20,000 subscribers and way over 3 million views last year, but it feels like I am Sisyphus trying to roll a heavier boulder with more and more additional weight up a steeper and steeper hill. In the last few weeks, all of my videos have been set to demonetization by default, and I have to manually protest each video. This is in addition to even lower than usual Google AdSense revenues after the adpocalypse started over a year ago for me. This has also affected my ability to get paid advertisers to agree to deals not involving YouTube, as I lost three grand per month in paid advertising deals at the end of June 2017 because all my analytics are down a lot thanks to YouTube censorship algorithms that have intentionally kneecapped the growth of my channel. With YouTube slash Google slash Alphabet slash Don't Be Evil strongly considering demonetizing or setting all libertarian, conservative, or pro-Trump content to private to prevent any sharing or monetization, it is imperative I have a contingency plan to figure out how to make a living off my content. Each 30 to 40 minute video takes a few hours of my time before it's released to the public. There's a strong possibility that in the near future, YouTube will force me to move all or almost all my content to a new video upload website that allows free speech or behind a paywall on my own website. Thanks if you have already made a one-time or recurring monthly donation, and thanks in advance for any future donations as I decide the future of my channel and what to do with my content going forward. We accept one-time donations on the Wall Street for Main Street website via PayPal, Bitcoin, or gold money. You can also become a monthly Patreon contributor for a buck or more a month if you want to help me out. And... Don't forget to like each video on YouTube and share it with your friends and family if you think they, li- they would like the content.